Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Orpheum Theater for tonight's conversation between artist Robert Longo and musician and writer Henry Rollins. I'm Joanne Heiler, the founding director of the Broad Museum and director of the Broad Art Foundation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Tonight marks the 11th talk in the Broad's unprivate collection series. Philanthropists and museum founders Eli and Edith Broad built the museum's art collection over the last five decades with one overriding goal, making it accessible to the public. As many of you know, the museum offers free general admission, which helps us meet that mandate, but we do more than that. We strive to open up dialogue and unexpected connections between the museum's collection and the broader culture. Our past unprivate collection conversations have included artist Jeff Koons with filmmaker John Waters, artist Kara Walker with filmmaker Ava DuVernay, and artist Takashi Murakami with renowned author Pico Iyer. At the Broad Museum itself, more than half a million people have visited since last September to enjoy the collection and our remarkable building designed by Liz Diller of Diller Scafidio Renfro. Thank you. And we continue to be at capacity every day, every hour of every day actually, with a standby line that has become its own LA phenomenon. <laughs> we try our best. We get everybody, almost everybody in. Um, with the opening months behind us, new developments are ahead. Our first special exhibition, Cindy Sherman, Imitation of Life, opens in less than a month on June 11th. This will be a full survey of work by one of the most influential artists to use photography as her medium, and the first museum exhibition of her work in LA for almost 20 years. In Cindy's photographs, she's her own model, donning a range of guises, many inspired by the image-making norms and foibles shaped by Hollywood. Advanced Cindy Sherman tickets for the month of June are available now at thebroad.org and always include general admission. Now a bit about tonight. Our unprivate collection talk tonight brings together two incredible cultural figures working in art, film, music, and more. Two risk-taking artists who constantly challenge boundaries. Robert Longo's work is as distinctive as it is hard to categorize. His work in the Broad Collection deploys charcoal drawing, photography, cut and sculpted metal, and more. Often large-scale, almost epic, his work is unafraid of raw visual power, while it also critiques the abuse of that power in contemporary life. When it first appeared, his work came to symbolize the changing socioeconomic landscape of 1980s New York City, with its corporate conservatism, rapid gentrification, vibrant nightlife, and climbing stock market. Hmm. Has anything changed? One of his most prominent works of recent years was on view when the Broad opened its first floor galleries, movingly depicting the Ferguson, Missouri police riots that took place in the summer of 2014. He's got it there. Um, throughout his career, Robert has expanded beyond art for gallery spaces. He's a musician, he's directed music videos, some of which you saw as you took your seats tonight, and he's also made film. This hunger for experimentation and expression pairs well with another contemporary Renaissance man, Henry Rollins. <laughs> Friends for over 20 years, Robert and Henry met on the set of Johnny Mnemonic, a 1995 sci-fi <laughs> sci cyberpunk action film that Robert directed and Henry acted in. The labels that follow Henry's name can make for a long list. Poet, writer, actor, DJ, punk rock icon, activist, humorist, and even motivational speaker. You may know his voice from his weekly KCRW program or from his days as the head banging front man for both the Rollins Band and Black Flag. His signature bluntness and impassioned curiosity for people around the world can be seen in everything from his multiple tours for the USO to his recent penning of a scathing LA Weekly piece about the governor of North Carolina signing 
House Bill 2. Robert and Henry share the skill of moving deftly across media throughout their long careers. We are truly delighted and honored to bring these two innovative thinkers and cultural observers together for this evening's conversation. Now a couple of uh, quick details. First, silence your cell phones, and note that tonight's talk is also being watched by an online audience, hello, um, via live video stream at thebroad.org. We'll also have a Q&A at the end of the program. Audience members and online viewers are invited to tweet questions for both Robert and Henry using the hashtag Longo Rollins. With that, it's my great pleasure to welcome to the stage Robert Longo and Henry Rollins. Thanks. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for showing up tonight to uh, hear this uh, scintillating Q&A with my good friend, Robert Longo. Uh, very rare do we have an opportunity to spend some time with an artist who is as good as he is prolific. He is quite amazing and he really doesn't mess around. He is dedicated to his work. And so in preparation for this, uh, one of his assistants wrote me and she said, I'd like to send you some of Robert's books. And I said, is he still sleeping in the park? And uh, she seemed to be on my page and she said, he's living in a tree. I said, well, that, um, I hope, get, make sure he keeps drinking soup and uh, you know, stay warm. And I said, he still owes me 40 bucks. And she said, we'll, we'll send it in nickels. So um, anyway, before we get into our talk, and we have some great questions for Mr. Longo, we're going to take a brief tour through 60 images of Robert's work. And so we're going to, right now on this screen, we will get into uh, 60 images for, uh, from all across uh, Robert's amazing body of work. And we'll get into that right now. Oh, with a soundtrack by Victor Longo, the very talented musical son. As, as soon as Robert gets it queued up, are we ready? Watch how he's gonna do this. This is... We're doing this because we have to have clear the rights. We couldn't use our other music, so I called my son up last night and I said, you got any, he sings and stuff like that. I said, you got any music tracks I can use? So he sent this, he sent this to me last night at midnight and I thought, it's kind of cool. I just have to find where the mic is. Thank you, Victor. Are we good? Are we ready? We're cool. All right. So Robert, the first time I saw your artwork was many, many years ago in the 80s when I bought the uh, Glenn Branca album, The Ascension. And I'd heard the record on KCRW, loved it, found my own copy. And there's a, a great uh, 
drawing a, a bit of art of yours from a series called Men in the Cities. And I know you've been asked about this series like a hundred times, but I'll make this really brief. Many of you have seen these images uh, of these kind of well-dressed men and women who look like they've been hit by some massive invisible fist or they're having some kind of glorious seizure. They, they, they're dressed well, but they look some, somewhat compromised. But in that, I find there's a real human truth to that. There's a beautiful, honest frailty in some of the uncool body gestures. And in that, it bespeaks to me of all of our moments where we're not, we don't look so good, where we're maybe at our most open, where we're, you know, the, where the, the good-looking person has a bad day like anybody else. And I think men in the cities showed that to me. But that's not important. You're the creator of this work. So I would like to ask you what your intent and what you wanted to get across in the Men in the Cities series. The thing is, I have to understand this is the, this happened towards the end of the 70s. And when I moved to New York, I moved to New York with Cindy Sherman. We lived down South Street. And the art world that we thought existed didn't really exist. What, it was dead. What was really happening was the music scene. And music was really quite the most exciting thing was happening. We were all playing in bands, things like that. And at the same time, you have to understand what's interesting about art is once art was freed from the church and from politics, it, left, it was left with this dilemma, well, what the fuck do we make pictures of, right? So the thing is, as, as an artist, as you have to figure out what, is, what are the images that you're going to make. The thing that I gravitated towards was I remember seeing the contortions, the band con contortions, and James Can Chance was this, did these spasmatic moves and he would fall off the stage into the audience. And it reminded me of like ways people died in movies. And one of the things that was interesting is as a kid growing up watching movies, like James Cagney died in a movie just like going, ugh. When people died in Sam Peckinpah movies, they got fucking blown through the wall, you know? And I thought that was, I played a game as a kid called Who Could Fall Dead the Best? And that was a game where one guy pretends to have a gun and the other kids run at you and you shoot. Whoever dies the best gets to be the guy with the gun. Follow, you following me? <laughs> anyway, so I found, we all, at that time, we were part of this kind of thing called the pictures generation bullshit, appropriationist. And I found this image from a, a still from a Fassbender film called The American Soldier. And it was this image of a guy being shot, and I made a, actually a cast aluminum relief of it. And it was in a pictures, it was in this show called Pictures. And this piece was, got an enormous amount of, ten, of tension. And I remember reading this great interview by this artist named Cornelis, who talked about, as an artist, it's really important that you work towards affection. And I realized people were like paying attention to that piece. They weren't paying attention to the bands I was playing in, the performances I was doing, things like that. So I decided to dump everything else and really focus on Men in the Cities, which I, the title comes from the, the record called, uh, it's a combination of Alice in the Cities, the, the Vendors film, film yeah. and um, the record called in the, Moder in, in the City by the, what, what's the name of the band? Fuck. I can't remember. Pete, Paul, Will, Jam, thank you, thank you. So it was a combination of that. So, what I, so I, I couldn't find any pictures in the magazines anymore, so I thought instead what I'll do is start photographing my friends. So I would get my friends, the clothes that we were wearing at the time were much more severe than the like, traditional punk stuff that everyone was wearing. We, basically we were wearing like shirts and ties, thin lapels, you know, stovepipe pants, things like that. And so I got my friends to wear basically the stuff they, they normally wore, when wore, everybody wore their uniforms. And I would took, up, took them up on the roof of my, my studio that was down in, by the Brooklyn Bridge, and I would throw stuff at them and take photographs of them. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, I think so, yeah, there you go. And I would shoot tons of pictures to find one picture that was really great, this moment. In, what's really fucked up is that over the years, somehow these people had become yuppies. And they're not yuppies. They're like my friends. They're like guys that are in bands. Like, it's like they're not the image. The thing was I was looking at, looking for a, a psychotic impulse, the moment in between moments. And I wanted to also get this. I was thinking about power chords in music. I mean, they usually were in a group, like three groups of three. So it was almost like 
I thought about Moybridge, but in a weird way with different rotations. But it, I wanted to have like a rhythm to it. I wanted to have a pounding. That what's really big, interesting to me is that these images, Men in the Cities, were images that you look at and they, they were instantaneous. They happened every time that you looked at them. I realized over the years my work has gotten much slower, <laughs> which this happens as you get older. But, but the thing is I wanted these images to have this really immediate impact. And the thing is, what's interesting as an artist is that if you're lucky enough in your lifetime to establish an archetype, which these images have become, you tend to have run the risk of losing authorship of them. And what's ironically, I remember that when this exhibition happened at the Met, I was with my younger son who, actually I'm here for his graduation. He's graduating, um, I guess, on Saturday. Which is interesting because that's I met I met I met Henry I met Henry when my son was born, which is kind of interesting. When we were making giant mnemonic, but his girlfriend at the opening of the Met. So these drawings at the Met at the time were 30 years old. The girlfriend asked me, "Did I get the idea for these drawings from the iPod ad?" Uh, a few days ago, I was in a hotel in Charing Cross and I was jet lagging and on my way to the breakfast room and it's an arty hotel and the last image before you walk into the breakfast room is a knockoff of one of the image and I, I looked for the name it's some guy and it's poorly done and they probably paid way too much and I was like wow you, he's Robert's so big he's now just in the ether of the big language you know, you're lost. Those, those images are probably appropriated all the time and no one knows it's you. Well, it's interesting. I ran, I ran away from these works. I basically stopped doing them in 83 and I, the work went into the combines and I just I pretended I never made them. Only recently, I kind of like decided to reclaim them and say, I made that shit. <laughs> they're, mine. they're mine. They're mine. Give me that stuff back. But then, well, I remember uh, the director who's doing American Psycho had asked me would I mind them using some of my images. And they jokingly joked about the fact that I would get best supporting actress, actor for the, for the... So the images appear in American Psycho, but then I thought that was cool. It was fine. Then the other day, I'm walking to my studio, and there's a huge billboard on my street for the musical American Psycho, where they're using images that look like my images, but they never asked me for anything. It was like, ah. Uh. So I have to view it as a compliment, basically, in that, in that sense. And I mean, what's interesting is that that cycle of losing authorship is it, it, is it really, I mean, we've all seen, you know, we've seen ads where you look like, they look like Cindy's work in fashion magazines, or you've seen graphic images that look like could be a Frank Stella or something like that. I mean, as artists, that's part, in a weird way, part of our job to influence visual culture. So maybe it, I take it as a compliment, ultimately, so. I have a question, two questions, actually, about your process. And I want to bring up a photo that we just saw uh, of an image of, uh, called a bullet hole, bullet hole and broken window, which is, from what I understand, was taken from the Charlie Hebdo attack in Paris. Mm -hmm. It is a bullet gone through glass. There it is. You're taking it from a photo, and a photo is determined very quickly when the shutter closes and opens, it's over. And so it is now your job to take it and apply every single stroke to bring this to life on a piece of paper. I think this image achieves a state of hyper-reality, I mean, where it becomes so much more than a bullet that went through glass. Everything in the, in the image is man-made. The glass, the pain, the bullet that went through it the damage, it's all what we humans get up to. But you humanize the image by taking it from a photograph, which is determined by lens length, uh, aperture, lighting, whatever. And so what I want to ask you about is what is your process, your emotional commitment to taking, going from a photo of something that awful and having to spend hours, days, weeks bringing that to bear? What are you going through in this process? Because I find it, I bet it would be impossible for you just to shut off and become a mechanical artist because that's not what you do. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm st still pretty pissed off in general about things the way things are in the world. And when I saw this image, it really, 
as an artist, I don't want to be political by choice. I mean, I feel I'm compelled to. Um, when I saw this image, I thought about the great tradition that happens in art of people making great art from catastrophes. And I thought about the Raft of the Medusa. And uh, this is a st horrible story about these people who have thrown off a boat, they have to build a raft, they have to survive on this raft, they, they have to eat each other. And it's, they're cut off from the people that are pulling them who are the aristocrats and they're basically the plebeians. Anyway, I thought how history hasn't changed that much. But I saw this image and I thought about the moment of impact versus how long I experienced when I made drawings of the abstract expressionists, the idea of how long it takes to draw a brushstroke versus how long it takes to make a brushstroke. This became an issue of how long did it take to, to draw a bullet hole versus how long it took to, to make the bullet hole. And the idea of seeing beauty in this thing was really important to me. At the same time, I wanted to deal with the, the shock of it. it. I wanted you to look at something that think it was really beautiful and at the same time realize, holy shit, this is really crazy. I mean, that was really important to me. And what happens is I end up, for lack of really horrible way of describing it, I tend to beautify it. I try to make it even more beautiful than it is because I want to make it more seductive for you to kind of get into it so that then you go, whoa, what the fuck am I looking at? Do you know, I think that's really important that you have this kind of like moment where you all of a sudden go, I'm thinking this, a bullet hole is really beautiful. I think it's really important to me. This happened a lot when I my work, for sure. Let's hold on that thought for a moment. And perhaps some of you have seen Robert's uh, drawing of a bunch of Klansmen around a burning cross. And it's so beautifully drawn. The fire on the cross is soft and it disappears into the night. The Klansmen's legs can be seen almost uh, translucent through the bottom of the robes, and they almost look ghost-like. Well, they do anyway, but there's a softness about the hoods. And it's a beautiful image of horrible people. And you look at it, and you can't stop looking at it. You're like, wow, this is so beautiful. And if you had to show it to anyone, you can't say out loud, hey, come over here and look at this beautiful drawing of members of the KKK. No, no, you're going to like, it's not like the other ones. You're going to love this one. And if you say you like it, you have to put in so many qualifiers. I'm not into the Klan, but it's, it's good anyway, right? Like I just did. And so my question to you is, is that subversive work? Are you trying to keep us held on that image? Like, it's so beautiful, but these people are so awful. You're kind of cooking us on some artistic grill, are you not? Yeah. Are you messing with us? Is that what you're doing, sir? I, 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 think, I think the thing is also, I'm married to a Europe European, and when we first met, I was watching two TVs stacked on top of each other, and, and I realized she couldn't deal with it at all. I mean, she can't watch, I watch, would watch TV all the time while I'm working. It's like, I realized, through her, I realized how incredibly anesthetized I had become by images. And I think the fact is, is that a lot of times I'm trying to deal with images that pass through the cracks, or that we just, see and don't really consider. I mean, I did this series of work called Magellan, and after I finished Giant Mnemonic, I was a bit lost, and I, I did a, a drawing a day, which is, was a, a way of trying to make all, picking this enormous amounts of images that come into our life that we basically have no idea what they're really doing to us. I wanted to make it an image a day accountable. So every day I made a drawing it's three, it was actually a leap year, so it was 366 drawings. And each day I chose an image to basically take in on a molecular level, it, to take that image, process it through myself, and do it. So I wanted each image to become a responsible to it, for itself. So in that sense, the clan image is kind of part of that. It's like we see so many images every day that, that they go in front of us, and we don't, I don't know if we actually see this stuff. I mean. Part of the reason I was trying to say before, Chris Hedges wrote this great book about called the, uh, I think it's called The Empire of Illusion. I think part of the reasons why I deal with trying to make realistic images is also with the fact that we're dealing with this world where, where everyone is dealing with this incredible level of illusion, illusion and fantasy, reality shows, sports, Donald Trump, <laughs> you know. The idea is I think we're losing sense of like, reality in that sense. So I, sometimes I want to grab these images that I think need to be more real than real. Because my drawings are not photorealistic. 
I mean, I would deliberately make them so that they're not illustrations. I, it's a really weird thing in the studio. Sometimes if the drawing goes a little bit too photorealistic, it's, I'm, I'm fucking it up. I, I have to find this weird zone between what is illustrate, like an illustration of photo or photo. It has to be itself. I mean, the problem is as an artist, it's like it's so hard to actually try to make something that's really truly new. But you basically, you basically aspire to try to make something that's real. So and that's what I think I try to do with these works. So in your version of success would be to take a photograph, make an image from it, and the fact that they look even remotely similar would be in some way coincidental because you would be putting your signature on every single dot that you're putting onto the paper using a fixed image that has set borders. That photo is never going to change. And every single time you apply yourself to the piece of paper, you're changing. And so it seems to me that the similarities would be not, they would be almost coincidental, where the art is the departure. Where, like I said, when you said it, you, if you get too close to the real image, you're failing. Yeah. You lose yourself to the reality. But the thing is, a lot, it started with Men in the Cities when I took photographs of, of people that I would shoot maybe five or six rolls of somebody and I wouldn't get what I wanted. So what I started doing is cutting and becoming Frankenstein and piecing together what I thought was what I wanted. So ultimately, all these images that I use photographs based on have all been altered in one way or another. So they could never actually be photographs. Because in that spectrum of like traditional representation and modernist abstraction, maybe I exist someplace in the middle. Maybe I'm somebody that's helping to translate photographs. Because the problem is we, I think we tend to, rem a lot of us, tend to have our memories almost are, we almost think in photographs or in that sense. I think the photographic image, when I say photograph, it sounds so old fashioned, but the, you know, the represent, the mechanically represented images is some way so deeply, profoundly imprinted in our, our memory that that's how we see or how we think we see. Well, let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about the past, the present, and these moments that kind of hover elsewhere, which I think, it, I find so much in your work. Any photograph that you're working from, by definition, is historical. Once you take a photo, it is immediately the past. But your work, in my opinion, exists in this hyper-present tense. And so, for you, what are the aspects of time, history, and memory going into your work? Bringing the past to the present, bringing the present to that marvelous moment that just kind of sits there eternally. I think I gotta go now. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's, what's interesting is as as you get old, as they get older. Um, when I was younger, I used to think I, I went into the f we went into the future, and I realize now, as I get older, I realize that the the future comes at us and it changes the past. And the thing is, what's really important to me that, that the work is, I want the work to happen every time you look at it. I want, I want, I mean, I love pictures that are narrative, you know, in the sense like, you know, Goya's execution or, the thing is, I like narrative pictures, but at the same time, I want my pictures to have a presence that is n n now. It's every time that you, men in the cities taught me to create images that happen every time you look at them. That's really important to me. So that, that's one of the goals is that I'm trying to deal with images that put, put you are there, you know, that kind of situation. I, I want you to be, I want the viewer to be part of the picture in that sense. And that's, really, and that's what's happened, the di biggest differences over the years is, is that it, the images now make you want to look longer at them as opposed to men in cities more, were more like impact. Right. Now you actually can like look at them longer. Yeah, that's what I find with, with a lot of your work, that, that idea of hyper-present, where it, it almost makes you hold your breath to look at these images over and over again. You know, I, I have books of your work uh, and, and different things I've cut out, and every time I look, I'm still arrested the same way. Um, let's get somewhat specific. You did uh, a line of work years ago, and you gave me a litho of one of them. You did a series of black American flags. I think the line was called Black Flags. And... Uh, <laughs> There's a, a, and if you've never seen these, it, it is some of the most powerful work I've ever seen. You can find them on the internet. It's really worth checking out. 
They're black flags that they are completely barren of color except black, but you can see the stars and the stripes. And to me, I'm not trying to read into your work, but it seems to me that's what we've done to America. And when I look at these images, I think of the Watts riots, the LA riots, the Washington DC riots, where I grew up smelling my city on fire. The failure of the civil rights movement is over and over again, people strove for equality. What we're doing to our waterways, what we're doing to our soil, what we're doing to our mountaintops, what we're fracking, we are just destroying this place. And ultimately, it's gonna look like those images. We are just gonna burn it up and there'll be nothing left for anyone. What, and so I'm reading a lot into these images, but boy, those things spoke to me. I mean, it was like getting assaulted. And I've had that one you gave me for the last 20 years haunting me. And so I, what's important is what you were putting across. So when you made these, this amazing series, what were you saying? Well, what was interesting, this thing about as an artist responding to the world that you live in is really important. And what caught my eye was an article at that time, reading an article about, it had to do with burning the American flag. This is like in like 1988 or something like that. And how they were trying to figure out a way how to make flags, uh, oh, flag, plain yeah. retardant. Yep. And I thought this was like so fucking ridiculous. It's unbelievable. <laughs> It's like, it's like, this is unbelievable. I mean, it's America. Should we, we could be, you know, British soldiers use the there British flag to polish the First Amendment here, yeah. yeah but anyway, it, it, so I think that was part of it. It was also that I remember seeing pictures of how in Palestinian camps, refugee camps, they, flow, they flew black flags over the, over the camps. And I thought that's an interesting thing. And I thought the thing about, obviously, I really loved the black flag. And, I thought it was a really cool name that I need to rip off, so. <laughs> and what, the first flags were drawings with charcoal, which I thought was kind of ironic because I'm drawing these drawings with burnt material. And then I took it one step further and then I cast flags in bronze. But they actually had slight color into them. I don't know if you know Ad Reinhardt's work, but they had, there was a slight red in the black, some of the stripes, there was a slight blue in, his, in the star fields, there's slight bits of color in it. So, I mean, the thing is, the black flag has been, is continuing in my work. I mean, the last show that I did in New York had a, this huge black flag that's embedded in, this is like 18 feet high, and it's stuck into the ground, and it's basically kind of like, I got really into Moby Dick, because I think Moby Dick is like the genetic code of America, so this is like the Pequod. You know, it's kind of made out of wax and wood. It looks like the hull of a ship, but, um, but yeah, the flags were, I found them really quite the way flag. I would walk around the city photographing flags. I went to the UN and stuff like that. But then I tried, I tried actually casting real flags and I got, became a real connoisseur of different kind of flags, stitchings on flags. I liked the flags that where the stars are embroidered, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Fashion statement. The great writer Hubert Selby Jr. once characterized himself as uh, a scream looking for a mouth. Have you ever had a situation where you had a feeling or some artistic compulsion but you had no image to attach it to? Basically the scream without a mouth. You were just looking for a place to put that energy but you had no image to affix, to affix that intent to. And if you had that situation, how do you get out of it? Basically, where, where the, there's no, usually if you find an image, you put yourself to it. But what happens when you have all this energy and nowhere to apply? Then I'd be really fucked. <laughs> well, does that, has that ever happened? Kind of the cart leading the horse? Or the tail wagging the dog? You know, the world has, I'm, I'm an image thief. That's one thing. And, and the world seems to provide, provided me with endless material to work from, for sure. And what was interesting, a really great example was when I did the Ferguson drawing, okay, and I did these cops, I was so freaked out by the, when I first saw these images of Ferguson. And can you go to the, to the full, full image for a second? And I thought, when I first saw these images, I went, and at first I went, this is like the Ukraine, or maybe this is like, you know, 
Islamabad or we know this is Iraq or something. And then I, then I saw off in the distance McDonald's. You see McDonald's up there way off in the distance on the left hand side? And then the Exxon sign. I went, this is the fucking United States. I was like so outraged when I did So I felt like I had to make this drawing. The irony was I wanted to do the, the protesters. I wanted to do, make a matching drawing to go with them. And the problem I was having is whenever I tried to do them, to work with the images, I couldn't do them justice. I mean, it sounds really horrible what I'm going to say, but all these people with their hands up, the way I was doing them, they looked like they were doing the Macarena. <laughs> and it, it wasn't working until the world gave me the Los Angeles, I mean, the St. Louis Rams receiving corps, which we all know are the crazy fuckers on a football team. They all came out when they were being introduced with their hands up, which blew my mind. And I thought this is like, I got, this is the, my solution. I thought about when, when John Carlos and Tommy Brown came out with their, their hands with the black gloves on. I thought this is a solution for me. And I, I thought about how here are, here are football players dressed like the cops, in equipment like the cops, being idolized by primarily a white audience. But the kid that was shot on the street was the size of a football player. And at the same time, you started to realizing that football was a way of keeping America, like the way the Romans kept, had gladiatorial games, a way of keeping us in a constant state of war. So in that sense, I, it was like, here, here's an answer, we're wanting an image, but didn't have one, all of a sudden the world delivered it. Right. I mean, I can count on the world being fucked up enough to give me stuff, I guess. Right. <laughs> um, your images are, are extraordinarily powerful, and I'm wondering if one of the ways to bring about this impact, this, this constant state of hyper-presence, I don't think you manipulate images, but I do think you allow, you, will, you basically practice a severe lack of restraint so the images don't lose any speed. Obviously, you affect the image because you're using your hand and it's your brain and it's your art, but you're not impeding the image. And so my question is, if I'm right, can you speak to the, the, the use of lack of restraint to get impact, of getting out of the way of the power of the image, getting your ego out of the way or whatever hang up you might have so the image really does its thing that you want it to do? You know, the, the kind of like a little true confession here is that, that I didn't read as a kid. I mean, I didn't. I only started reading once I got sober, and I became somewhat of a voracious reader. But um, the thing is, is I grew up watching television, and one of the things I watched, I realized, and movies, but I realized the thing that had a huge impact on me was the epics, like uh, you know Ben Hur, Spartacus, The Longest Day, you know all those epic movies had this. And I realized that somewhere deep inside of me is this, this desire to want to get, make these epic images that kind of like <sighs> give you a little bit of that. And that's what I realized I'm trying to go, always go after. I'm trying to go and get, make these images that kind of shake you. I mean, at least they should shake me. That's what I mean. That's, I realize I'm the first, the first audience for yeah. my own work in that sense. But I think that sense, that restraint is like, there are certain, clearly certain images I won't go near. I mean, I don't, I can't, I, very clear to me, I, as a white man, I, there are certain images I just can't go near. I mean, but at the same time, I'm well aware that as a white man, I'm res my tribe is responsible for most of the shit in the world, but in the same time, it's like, restraint is a really, I mean, I don't know so much restraint. I mean, there are some certain guidelines for it, but I mean, the thing is, I'm, I go out to, after images, I think shock is a really cheap yeah, I, thing. I, I don't think you would ever do that. And I think some of the, my theory is the, one of the reasons your work is so monumental is because you're really letting the story tell itself. And you're just this groovy vessel that's letting it happen. And you're not putting your ego in the way, trying to make yourself look good. You're letting it be. But taking it to that hyper reality from a photograph, which is just a clinical snap of a shutter, it's over. You're putting in hundreds of hours, weeks, obsessing over this. 
One thing I, I wanted to ask is a thing about choice. And there's two series in particular. In my opinion, just as an observer of your work, you are in pretty much control of the image. You're, you're determining the size, how many panels, because some of these works are epic size. But there are two series, just my opinion, where the, you weren't always, you weren't really in control. That you, you seem slightly overwhelmed. And they are the series of waves and the series of mushroom clouds. And so my question is, did you draw the images or did the images draw you? I mean, this is the only time I've seen you kind of like, okay, it's like you're being covered by that wave and those mushroom clouds. They're beautiful. Again, you don't want to look, but you keep looking. But they seem like they overpowered you. Yeah. That's interesting because the, I think making art for me is this really critical balance. Like, remember the old radios where you could tune in a radio station? I think it's about tuning in between something that's highly personal and somewhat socially relevant. So the waves and the bombs have a very personal connection to me because I have three sons. My middle son, Victor, wanted to learn to surf. And I had always surfed as a kid. And I remember taking him out in the water. And at that time, I had just finished Magellan. I was kind of lost. I didn't know what I was doing. And I was in the water pushing him into the waves. And my work in the 80s was always about these kind of like meditations or mediations on power. And here, there I realized, here I am in nature. This is like real power. And I went back to my studio one day during the Christmas vacation. I, I, I wanted to actually get away from the kids. But, um, and I wanted to draw a picture of a wave. But I realized I couldn't find any, my normal material, which was graphite. And I ended up using this charcoal. And the first wave was made in like, uh, 1999. And the waves became like, they, they kind of happened almost by themselves. It became almost like psychological profiles because the more I learned, it, each series that I've done, I, I, I do research about the work. So I found that how a wave, the shape of a wave is dictated by ha what happens deep underneath it. So the shape becomes like a weird psychological profile. But the irony, what happened is, is that when I was working on the waves, 9-11 happened. And um, I started taking parts of the smoke from the newspaper and putting them into the waves and the fire because I was so freaked out by this whole thing. And someone sent me a picture of the towers falling down with a lot of smoke. They thought it would be cool for me to see. And when I printed it out of my printer, it came out upside down. So it was like the clouds with the building. And I went, holy shit, this looks like atomic bomb. And I thought about Bush being this lunatic that he's going to use an atomic weapon. And I started thinking about my kids. And I took Life, ma I saved Life magazine. I grew up with picture magazines. That was really important. I took these magazines home to look at. And I remember showing the atomic bombs to my kids. And my youngest son asked him, what do you think this is? And he said, it's a hurricane. And I thought, wow, this is like man trying to be God. And I felt I had no choice. I had to make these images. And at the same time, the government had just released a whole bunch of new images of atomic bombs. So these images became interesting. There's also, these images also created this whole issue of scale for me that I can make big things small, small things big. I, I tried to create this kind of like in, intimate immensities or something like that. I started fucking with scale. Like roses became really big. I started realizing I was trying to deal with things at, at their moment of being. Like a wave crashes, a bomb explodes, a rose blooms. I mean, I got really involved in these kind of issues. But what happened is, at that point, I, I always think about those, remember those cartoons where those gigantic robots, did, but there's a, there's a little guy inside driving it? I realized I wasn't driving anymore. It was like I was just following the work. The work was saying, go this way. And the next thing would happen would be, you know, I would, each series, this, there was a series, what happened is these series of works happened one right after another. I almost didn't predict when they would happen. They just kept, they kept on going. Like after the waves came the planets and after the planets came uh, uh, ch sleeping children. And after sleeping children came the sharks. And after that I stopped and I didn't know what I was doing. I was completely lost. And then I have this cousin, Regina, who's a born again Christian. She's a bit nutty. At Christmas dinner one time, she said to me, 
you know, your, your work is like Genesis. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> and she left, and I remember looking in the Bible. I have to preface this by saying, when I, when I was working on Magellan, that 366 images, I was reading a lot of Jung, I, I, the idea of collective unconscious, I kept thinking, what are the images of the collective unconscious? I said, fuck it, I give it up. But anyway, when I, when, I looked in, when I looked in the Bible and I looked in it, I realized that I had made basically Genesis. I, these, each category kind of fit in the sky, the planets, the water, the sharks. I mean, so all of a sudden I felt free to make a world. At that point, I, the work literally exploded. That's when I became in control. Things at that point, then I said, I want to make an image of this, I want to make an image of that. I didn't wait anymore for the, the work to tell me what to happen next. I was it, all of a sudden, I want to do forests, I want to do flags, I want to do, I want to do riots, I want to do airplanes, I want to do this. I, I, all of a sudden, it just like exploded. Um, there's a, a massive uh, drawing you made of the Hajj uh, to, to Mecca which is about two million breathing humans. Um, and it's taken from a photograph. And again, the photograph will be clinical. And a cynical person would look at that and, well, well, deploy the weapon there. Uh, <laughs> and they would see lots of little heads depending on the focus of the lens. But for you to, to complete this, you had to engage emotionally with every single one of those dots that's a person you depicted. My question to you is, what was the emotional impact every day when you'd wake up going, wow, I still have, oh, 30,000 more people to depict who've gone on this amazing journey, which must be completely life-changing. So what did you go through? I'm so curious about this. What did you go through to finish this? I hired a couple other guys. <laughs> really? Yo, let's not, let's not, let's not be, I have assistants. I was an assist, I was an assistant, I worked for artists, I have an assistant. If I, if I made these drawings by myself, they, we, we, we would be looking at six slides. <laughs> I'm not, my work ultimately has, I finish my work and it has one hand, that's really important to me. But I have assistants, I have really great young artists working for me, and I don't teach. But I don't try to teach how to make art. I teach these guys how to be artists. That's really important in that sense. So I hired a couple guys to help me with, with, with the, just, just to do, help me with the people because there were so many fucking people. <laughs> so, so basically what you're doing is you, you perform the surgery and you go, okay, guys, close it up. Well, actually. Where this becomes somewhat mechanical, but they can be artistic. Well, what happened, with the way it was made, with, here's a perfect example of how to get the, This is made from about five or six different images. So the, the cabal and the, the thing in the middle, the, that's actually bigger than it really is. So I thought it would look better, better if it was bigger. Because it actually, in reality, it's smaller. So I, I liked it being bigger. So I changed the image already. Then all the people, I tried to figure out, do I give them a swirl? Do, do I try to imitate that, them, their movement? It went through so many mutations. I mean, all the people do have, they're all, they're got, there are women there that have hats on, there are guys that, you know, have different kind of outfits on. And it also became this thing about learning about this place, where they come into, where they, how they exit. And the thing that disturbed me, oh, also, I, this is that little silver thing there, that's the, where the footprint of Abraham is. Um, I started learning all about this, all, all about this. I mean, the thing that's interesting about 9-11 is 9-11 forced us to learn about Islam. I mean, I didn't know anything about Islam. I, then my kid was in school at the time, in uh, elementary school, and he came home and he said, I know the five pillars of, of the Quran. I thought, this is, this is interesting. It's, it's an ed educational, but what I found interesting, what bothered me immensely about this place is that it's surrounded by, in the background, by buildings, these horrible apartment buildings that people can buy for millions of dollars so they can look down into it. And I ended up creating a skyline back there it, that I basically used Los Angeles. <laughs> but the thing is, is that I also think a lot of the images that I make are images that I will never see. 
like planets. I will never see planets. I hope I will never see a shark <laughs> like that. You know, I hope I will never look down in the barrel of a gun. But I wouldn't mind going there, you know. I wouldn't mind be going, going to Mecca. It looks like an incredibly amazing place, but I mean, that piece took for, forever, forever. It's, it's, about, it's about 15 feet tall and about 28 feet wide. It's fucking big. <laughs> and the people, you can kind of see there's a little bit of a... Anyway, it was part of a, a group of work called God Machines, which I thought was interesting because I, I started realizing the first great technology is religion. It kind of like moves us, right. with, you know, without, without us having to do anything. It's like the car, of, it's the spiritual car or something. But, so this is St. Peter's. This was an image where I really hated the place. It was like, I realized this is not about religion. This is really about the popes, because all these busts of the popes, it came to a kind of secretive place. It had this feeling like these windows off in the corner, there were these priests up there looking down at you. So it kind of, kind of creeped me out. But anyway, I, all these works, I actually really kind of have to do a certain degree of research so I can understand them as, as best I can. I so this is the God Machines. And this is the Mecca, St. Peter's, and the West Wall. Yeah, the Western Wall is a beautiful juxtaposition because I looked at this, at this pretty closely. I can't find any people there. And I've been to the Western Wall a couple of times. It's always crowded. You, it, it, also, they have these horrible white plastic chairs. I don't know if any of you have been there. These horrible white plastic chairs. And every picture I had I always had these horrible chairs. And then all of a sudden I realized it's divided. The yeah. men go over here and the women go over there. And the guys get to go into this air conditioning room over on the left hand side in the corner. I said, we're going to get rid of everybody. There's not going to be anybody there. It's just, just me going to see the Yeah, it's an astonishing image because I've never seen it without tons of people. And there's that wall. The men are on the left, the women are on the right. What's interesting is, is the stuff that was growing on the walls mm -hmm. starts to, in black and white, it starts to look like, look like, like cannonball holes in the wall. It starts to get really. It's also interesting. You can see how the different, when you did the drawing, you started to realize all the different layers of sizes of bricks, how it has changed sides, how they built it. Each piece had different, anyway, blah, 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 blah. Okay, next thing. So let me ask you about this. You're a New Yorker, and we live in an amazing country. New Yorkers, the East Coast to me is an, I come from Washington, D.C., a little south of you. But East Coast people, they're kind of like a shook up can of Coke with a tab popped. You know, loud, they want it right now. And you, you come out to the West Coast and you feel like a barracuda chewing through people. You know, hey man, how you doing? Shut up, give me another thing. I want to... and, and when you go back to New York, you can barely keep up with real New Yorkers who are like punching you out and going into the subway and they're saying good morning. And to me, you have a lot of New York in you. There's a New York energy to your work where it's, it's just so immediate. But there's also a lot of violence. And, I'm, and, and I know that you're not someone who admires violence or you're not a violent person. But it is a part of the work. It's an energy that informs your work. And I want to ask you about violence in your work. Like Ferguson is so ominous. Here come these, like, these robotic law enforcement delivery machines like automatons coming through the mist where you can't reason with that person and that's the face of law enforcement that terrifies all of us because the law doesn't matter to these people it's a violent image and and you're really bringing it to us in a very dramatic way without hyperbole tell me about you and violence in your as it pertains to your work if it does at all. Well, the thing is, <clears throat> I, I grew up, because of being dyslexic, things like that, I, I got into lots of fights growing up. I was always in fights. And then I was steered towards boxing, and I played football. I really liked violence. I liked, liked that, you know, I liked the, the impact of that stuff. And that's when I remember hearing, like, the Sex Pistols. I really loved hearing those slashing guitars and stuff like that. At the same time, I like the idea of violence, but I just don't like the idea of hurting anybody. Right. You know, I like smashing shit. I mean, I mean, don't you guys like smash stuff? Throw, break, break come bottles, something like that? There's something great about that experience. So I mean, that, again, it's about this high impact moment for sure. Right. On the other hand, it's like, you know, I think 
violence is not what's in what I'm, what I'm doing. It's, it's something different. It's something, it's, there's some other, it is something different. It's not violence. I, I don't think it can, it's qualified as violence. It's some, it's some other shit that I, you know, I mean, there's three things I think, sometimes I think I can't express in words because I, I think words are sometimes, are, that's why I make art. I think like there's three things that when words are not enough, there's like fighting, fucking, and making art. You know, it's like, it's, in that sense, I think, to me, it's like, I can't get enough, well, of course, people can talk when they do all those things, I'm sorry, but, but, but it's important to me that, that I, I'm dealing with stuff that I can't actually articulate. I mean, I do believe that art is a form of understanding, which I think is really important. Like, I think you heard me say this, I, I, like science and sociology and things like our understandings, but maybe art has the capacity to hold all these things and to help us maybe understand our contemporary situation in that sense. I think it's a really kind of important, I, I think it should also pose questions of why. I think, not, I mean, I know sometimes when I go to see art shows and I see some shitty art, I go, why? That's not what I'm talking, I'm not talking, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like, question art that makes me think why, I think it's important. As, as far, and, and I, I have such a, a, a high respect for art. Oh, thank you very much. But well, we're going to get into the Q&A in just a moment, folks. Um, I was raised by you know, my mother who had pitch-perfect taste in music, and the small apartments we lived in in Washington was walls of books, art, Coltrane, Mozart, Chopin, Bartok, Streisand, Mary McKay, but just really good music, great books, and no TV, just a lot of reading and listening and trips to the record store. And I, I understood at a very early age that the only thing that separates us from really being, coming a dangerous, scary, toxic place is art at the forefront, culturizing us. When we get together and we dig some art, we go to a rock and roll show and everyone is peaceful and fun and has a great time for 90 minutes and they go back to their, their aggression. I've always thought that a country without culture, a country without art is a very dangerous place. And the only people keeping us from more Fergusons are the music, are the painters, are the dancers. You know, people just saying, no, 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 this is an option. We can dance, we can paint, we can art out and be crazy and look ridiculous. Um, and, and obviously you find all of this important. You've dedicated your life to your work. What is the importance in your mind as far as art and making people better? Well, I think, I think art is my religion. I do believe that. And I, I, I think about it in the, in the sense of how many people have been killed in the name of art. It's not bad religion, right? Um, in that sense, I think it's really important that, that, that sense that art is about believing in something. And I think that to have that opportunity to share those things is really important in that sense. You know? But I think it's, I always get weirded out when I think about what can happen in a country if things start getting oppressed. I'll be probably, stop, someone will tell you you can't, you can't make those images anymore. I, mean, I'm, I'm a, I can imagine that shit happening. Right. You know, that scares me a little bit. But I'm, I was lucky like you where I had a sister who was an opera singer. And she turned me on to like opera, she gave me books, things like that. I was lucky enough to have these kinds of things. I mean, I think education is a really important thing. I mean, it's horrible that they don't have art education in classes, school. I mean, the history of art is, is, a, is a thing that is meant to be used to get to the next level. Like every artist, their goal as artists is to establish rungs on ladders for the next artist to step on and to establish their rung, you know? I mean. I know the guys that I've stepped on, and I know people who are stepping on me, but I think it's really important that, that we have this possibility, I mean, sure. to be able to make what we do. I mean, I'm also a product of the government funding. Both Cindy Sherman and I got, when we moved to New York, both got NEA grants. At a point when I was driving a taxi, she was working at ANS and something like that, we got money to all of a sudden make our work that from the NEA grants. Artists don't have that anymore. This is really horrible. The problem is now they get, it's, it's very difficult to be a young artist for sure. I mean, I think, I mean, I feel for, that's why a lot of, I have a lot of young artists working for me. 
I mean, but it's really hard out there. It's really hard. It's very hard for them. Because now it's, it all gets very confusing with the marketplace and things like that. The, a lot of young artists think they have to have their shows right away. They don't realize being an artist is a long distance run. It's, it's, it's a very, very confusing thing, yeah. But you have to understand, when I moved to New York, I never, never thought I would make money from my art. I thought I would maybe have a gallery, get a little stipend, maybe I would teach at school. You know, I, I would drive a taxi, but I never thought I would make money from my work. And, it, and that, that was really, a really, I mean, I, I think if there is God, he's the guy who gives out luck. You know, I feel really lucky. But I also think I had enough, I, so, I associated with a lot of really interesting people, and I created a net where luck had a chance to visit me, better chance to visit me, right. in a sense. Yeah, it, it, to me, this country without culture, without art, and at least for the last 40 years, there's been a real effort to suppress art, no more NEA grants, oh, they're just gonna take a vat of urine and put a crucifix in it, that's all those artists do. To where, you know, people like yourself are just seen as degenerates who waste money, do drugs, and don't get anything done. When I, I think that uh, art is the thing that humanizes us and keeps us from road rage, from all kinds of awful things. And that's why I always encourage people whenever I can, like, you know, go to the show, uh, go to the museum, you know, like, buy that guy's t-shirt, he's in a band, he's starving, like, keep, let's keep this conversation going. And you know, young people send me their CDRs of their band practice, like, what do you think? And it's really mediocre. Uh, well, it's okay, but I always write back and say, I'm so glad you're playing music. Like, just make sure to have fun. You know, don't strangle the bass player, you're gonna wanna do it. But you know, it doesn't have to be the next best thing. The fact that you're arting out, that you're in your garage, that you're not hitting someone, that you're hitting a snare drum instead, rumble, young man, rumble. And like, you know, keep it going. It, it, it could be an appalling mess. If you're having fun, you're enriching your life and you're maddening the neighbors, but you're enriching them too. And, and, and just one quick little question, then we'll get to the Q&A, and then we all have to run out of here. But talking about music, you've been listening to music and been in bands pretty much as long as you've been making art. Like you can't, those who know something about you cannot separate you and art from music. You're from a really interesting, very potent scene. Now when you work in your, in your studio, do you have music on? Is music part of, of the fuel that gets you to, to keep, you know, carry out all this work? Oh, absolutely. We have huge speakers in the studio. I mean, it, as soon as we start in the morning, it, it starts blasting. I mean, usually in the morning we start off with classical. I really like Yo-Yo Ma, like the cello solo concertos. I think those are fucking beautiful. By 11 or 12 o'clock, it slides into like Godspeed, Black Emperor or something like that. Nice. Uh, it slides sometimes into country music a little bit here or there. Lunch happens, and after lunch, rap. Because every, everybody kind of needs to like pick it up a little bit, you know. So, and it's music is constantly going on, constantly going. On. I mean, music. You have to understand, music got me to where I am for sure. Because I, I go back to thing, the Men in the City stuff was a response for playing in bands. I mean. And I still play in a band now with my wife and John Kessler and a bunch of old guys from the Swans. John, Jonathan Kane is, is the original drummer of the Swans. Uh, Ernie Brooks is the original bass player from the Modern Lovers. So we're all guys, but we still make really loud fucking music, which is really great. I mean, I do really like loud music. I mean, I still like it. There's nothing greater than like a really great power chord on a, on a guitar. I made a movie once where our wonderful director would have us take music breaks and the set we were working on was loaded with JBL monitors. And he would come up to me during these music breaks where it was Rammstein playing at internal organ liquefying volume. <laughs> and he had an angler's cap with a long bill and he would talk to me through a megaphone. Uh, don't you think this sounds great? And I, I said, I can hear you, we're staying, I don't need to hear the mega light. I just think it sounds cool. <laughs> David Lynch. And, and, and he really understood the power of the music break and uh, very, very instructive. I did, I, did an album cover, I did an album cover for Rammstein. They called me up and said, we really want, to do, we want you to, I had never heard them before. And then they said, we'll send you some music. I went, fuck, okay, sure. It was like, it was, like, it was a bit extreme for sure. 
<laughs> but I thought it, they ended up using one of the guns or their album cover or something that was kind of funny, but yeah. So uh, I, we have some questions. Actually, this, this is a, a band called Menthol Wars that was 1978. That's actually Richard Prince on the far right. Where is that? At, at Tier 3. Tier 3, wow. We were, we, were, we were like this band that played like maybe four or five times, became somewhat uh, a myth. <laughs> and then Richard and I decided to become artists. So. Now look at those monitors not covered with vomit. <laughs> yeah, early on, before the good times. Uh, okay, this is a question for both you and me, old pal. Uh, what's your favorite memory of filming Johnny Mnemonic together? Oh, I have so many. And I heard your laughter when that film was mentioned. <laughs> soft, soft. Like... Yeah. You know what? I, have... <laughs> I heard it. <laughs> the making a Johnny Mnemonic was, was, a, was a torturous experience, but I made some really great friends on it. Keanu, I think Keanu's maybe here. He's a dear friend, and I think he's a really great actor. Um, the thing is that you have to understand that originally I wanted to make a black and white film kind of like Alphaville, but I couldn't raise like, you know, $2 million. So instead I got $28 million. When, when people give you money, they think they can tell you what to do. And it was really pretty fucking a horrible experience. So Johnny and Monica is about 65% of what I hoped it would be. But the greatest compliment I has, I have an apartment in Berlin and a friend of mine who's, uh, he's, he's into real dark black hackers, these like really extreme guys, and they send me videos of them doing lines from Johnny Mnemonic. They love Johnny Mnemonic. <laughs> to them, I, when I saw this, wow, this is really great. But um, I think the thing is it was a difficult experience for sure, but the irony about Johnny Mnemonic and Henry and I is I made Henry wear a pair of really stupid glasses like this, and now I'm wearing them. There's your payback, buddy. <laughs> so here's my memory. The last shot, my rap shot, was the, the fight scene with me and Dolph Lundgren, who <laughs> took a break from his career and put down a plastic sword and whatever pelt he was wearing in his previous work. And I tried to be, I'm a, I'm a get-along kind of guy, and I meet everyone on the set. Uh, Keanu Reeves could not have been nicer. Wonderful guy. You were great. Uh, you know, really friendly people there. So I go bounding up to uh, Dolph Lundgren and go, how do you do? I I'm Henry. I'm going to, and he's like, <laughs> I'm like, there's n n nothing. I give you nothing. <laughs> and he's like impossibly big, so you can't kick his ass. You just have to go like, all right, this tree tall man is like, you know, not a very nice guy. And the last uh, scene, I'm like strapped into some chair and we're having some mutated fight scene. I blocked low, he punched high, something, but this fist, like a UPS delivery truck, hit me like, pow, like a, my DNA uncoiled. I mean, it was like, I found a new religion. He hit me so hard, and it just kind of like, just stopped. My head just took the entirety of, of the weight. And I'm like, wow, I, I'm thinking 20% slower. I'm running for, I'm running for office. And, and so everyone, everyone kind of stopped. Like, oh, the talent's been hit. And everyone heard it. It was juicy. And I, I was like, ah, oh, because uh, it wasn't the shot we needed. And he said, don't worry, you're tough. <laughs> I said, well. You have to understand, when we were making this movie, they, they, they were going around to try to raise money for the movie. And each week, the people who were trying to raise the money for the movie would come back to me and tell me I had a new actor in the movie. <laughs> and, and they came back, well, to sell the movie in the Middle East, we have to have Dolph Lundgren. Oh, fuck, no! <laughs> so Gibson and I go, we have Dolph Lundgren in the movie. What, how can we do, what can we do with him? And William says, we'll make him Jesus. Yeah, glue a beard on him, give him a wig. So wait, we have to explain. And Dolph shows up for the shooting of the film and he shows up with his acting coach. Like a guy with a cape and shit like that and a cane. It was like, we said, get the fuck out of here. But the thing is, it was, you know, that's part of the problem. So you, 
people who have to give you the money can try to tell you what to do, and it was really quite torturous. I mean, we tried to make the best movie we could possibly do. I mean, it was really hard, for sure. I mean, I appreciated the people being in the movie. It was, God, I, I had this, I talked to William recently, and I said, you know what, William I had post-traumatic stress from that movie, for sure. <laughs> And we, I said, you know what, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it black and white, I'm going to re-edit it for the 25th anniversary, I'm going to release it on the web. So, that's, so we're and actually right now we're in the process of trying to figure out how to do that. We're gonna, it'll be like the new version, the, the, you know, the 45 minute version of it, you know. He, Without Dolph! He, he sent me books. He was a really nice guy. Here's another question. Um, uh, has technological innovation Im impacted your practices, I guess your artistic process? Uh, I'm not really good with a computer. I have a, this, is, this, this is my new iPhone, it's too fucking big. <laughs> I feel like the top of it should come off, cigar should come out of it. You know? <laughs> but uh, uh, I, what's really great about the, the technology for me is that because I'm a searcher in relationship to images, I, I have a really great guy, his name is Q, he's, he's actually from China, who I say, okay, I need, Im I want images of, find me images of tigers, find me images of uh, jellyfish, find me images, whatever. And he goes searching for the images on the internet. So we'll find hundreds of images, we'll try to find the photographers to buy the rights for them. So as a, the, the internet has provided me with an enormous amount of images, for sure. Otherwise, technology doesn't interest me that much. I mean, it's like, I mean, I'm still like kind of Rosetta Stone kind of guy. I, I want the hard copy still. I mean, I think the one thing about technology, what it, what it ha has done for artists is it has made the des desire to have art increased. That's one of the reasons why art is so expensive, because it's a one-of-a-kind recording. It's a one-of-a-kind recording. Just imagine what a one-of-a-kind recording of Miles Davis a or a one-of-a-kind recording of Beethoven playing a piano sonata. What would that cost? But art is a, is a record of a performance. It's a one-of-a-kind re recording of a performance. And that's technology, the, the reproductive method is of the internet and digital has made one-of-a-kind that much more valuable. So as artists have really truly benefited from that for sure. Here's a question I wish I wrote myself, because I've always wanted to see your head explode. Um, if you can't answer this, I would not be surprised. Um, here we go. I just, I'm glad you're sitting. What do you want to do with your art that you haven't done yet? You want to stick it somewhere? You want to uh, monogram golf bag? What do you want to do with that art of yours? Mugs at Burger King in time for the next uh, Jurassic Park. You know, the irony, is, the irony is that I think I'm always... I just did, did, did this big show in Paris, and, and um, I'm getting ready to do this big show in, in, in Moscow, but I'm actually... What I'm thinking about is what is the next work I'm going to make, and sometimes I always feel lost, which is like a... Because I, when I see my shows and stuff, I, I basically look for the mistakes I've made. I, I'm trying to figure out how I can make things better. And in that sense, I'm never completely satisfied, which I think is good. But um, I'm thinking about what I want to make next. It's really important to me. And, and the, problem, the problem I have is that my wife wants me to take a vacation. But I... I kind of driven by what I feel like I have to make these things. I mean, I will, I promise I will take a vacation, but, but the thing is I, I feel the need to make these things. I, I have just no, I just am compelled to do so. What I haven't made yet, I will make. Um, can I offer just two suggestions as far as doing something with the art that you haven't done yet, and I really think you should. Um, mushroom cloud thong, and a uh, shark onesie. Just to, you know, just Inspired. No, that, that, that's ironic because I get a lot of approach by a lot of designers to ask me to, to collaborate with them and stuff. And I don't know shit about fashion, so... Um, and Paul Smith asked me to collaborate with him on something. And I don't know who Paul Smith is. One of the guys in my studio goes, oh, you should do it, he's so cool. I say, okay, ask him what he wants to do. And 
they send me these pictures of these brightly colored, like blue and pink t-shirts with men in the cities on them. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> I mean, it was like, are you fucking crazy? Yeah, I told you, boom. <laughs> anyway, I mean, I, I just, I haven't, fashion stuff, yeah, anyway. I, I, I have collaborated with Narcissa Rodriguez on, on some, some stuff. We did some from benefits. We've done a bag or something like that, but, but otherwise I'm, yeah, no, no. The song is I may be, <laughs> the home, I always think of the home with a whopper. You ever see those underpants? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got four dozen pair at home. <laughs> uh, last question. It's a great question, Robert. Of, your, uh, of all your series, which is the most intimate that you identify with? Uh, the Sleeping Children. Mm. Because the sleep, I have three sons. My youngest son was turning... 13 at the time and it was quite revealing to me that I was rationalizing the reason why I didn't know who these sleeping kids were I found their images on the internet and stuff like that but I realized what I was doing is my baby was no longer a baby anymore and I was drawing babies it was like it was kind of weird I was trying to hold on to children at the same time I was thinking about the world is so fucked up this is the, I don't want them these I was drawing these kind of severed heads of these children but they were all sleeping you know I did I kept on thinking do I want them to wake up to this fucked up world that we were living in at the time but but I realized how revealing it was to me that that it was so much about my youngest kid becoming a man and that that, that he wasn't that anymore, you know, and this is a way for me to basically create these surrogates for myself, you know. It was really weird to being in a studio surrounded by like eight drawings of little children's heads. It was a bit weird, but... Thank you for that. Beautiful. Um, there are a few thank yous are in order. Uh, thanks to The Broad for bringing Robert Longo to Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> And uh, we're, we're all grown up, so we can speak frankly. It's uh, early in the week, and a lot of us have an excruciating wake-up time tomorrow morning. So thank you for uh, uh, putting your night uh, on the bonfire uh, to come down all the way downtown, where parking was probably a massive pain. Um, hopefully, uh, this was a wonderful evening. And uh, I'd, I'd like to thank, on behalf of perhaps all of us, thank you, Robert, for your great work. And, uh, Thank you, Henry. Henry. So, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we basically have to take our leave. So uh, thank you, and we'll, uh, we'll see you down the road. Thank you so much for coming. Good night. Thank you.